Hello, on today's Pots and Trials, I'm going to be answering your gardening questions, which is brought to you with the support of Dalak and Cobra Garden. Hello, welcome to Pots and Trowels. Just had a busy afternoon hoeing in the garden. Perfect weather conditions here in North Yorkshire. I know lots of places have had rain. We haven't, so it is bone dry. So perfect to use your Dutch hoe and to chop off those weeds. Also picked a cabbage. This is one called Duncan. This is gonna be taken home for tea when I've done this with you. Because this week I promised that I would answer some of your gardening questions. So I deserve a sit down after being out in the hot sun up this afternoon so I'm going to sit in the shade of the fruit trees and answer some of your gardening questions. Now you sent in lots and lots of questions which is great unfortunately we're not going to have time to answer them all otherwise it's going to be as long as a football match um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is answer them in two batches half today and then in a couple of days time I'll answer the other half so if yours isn't answered we haven't forgotten you listen out for it on Facebook in a couple of days time. So First questions are on climbers um, and this one comes from two people, Janet Reed and Vicky Carr. They'd like to know what variety of rose was by the front door in last week's Pots and Trowels. Remember we talked about climbers and was it planted in the soil or in a pot? Well, it was a lovely climbing rose called Zephyrin Druin, which has got dusky pink flowers. It's not got many thorns on it. It's got a lovely compact habit and doesn't get too big. So it's a perfect rose, plus it's got that lovely scent. So Zephyrin Druin is the one and the, the two roses that we saw either side of the door were growing in the ground. Uh, I always think roses are better in the ground they can get the roots out so one to look out for. Sarah Evans would like to know what causes the leaves on her rose to turn yellow. They've been sprayed with a rose fungicide but they're still yellow and falling off. Well it can be caused by several things Sarah could be the drought um, you know if you live somewhere where you haven't had rain we've certainly not had any rain to count to, to speak of for about six weeks only the odd light shower so some plants are stressed roses will lose some leaves the bottom leaves will go yellow uh, as a protection or it could be the start of black spot but if you use the fungicide that will protect the new growth so what I would do is if it is dry give it a really good soak bucket of water of an evening around the roots let it soak down a liquid feed and hopefully the new growth will be much better and the final Final climbing question comes from Martin Winterburn. Uh, he planted two wisterias either side of the door. They've been treated the same, they've flowered together, they're pruned the same and fed and all the things, but one of them is now dying back and he just doesn't understand why one is almost dead and the other one is thriving. Well, unfortunately that can happen sometimes and we had exactly the same situation with a couple of wisteria four or five years ago, planted at the same time, lived for six or seven years and one suddenly died. And we think it was the drought the previous season that caused ours, but it could also be a wet winter that damages the roots. They can uh, suffer from a disease called Phytophthora, which rots the roots. And it just might be that that one is in a bit of soil that stays is wetter hence the reason it's been affected you'll probably never know but what I would do is cut it back a little bit into living wood if it is dry around the roots give it a feed but a seaweed is good for promoting root growth keep your fingers crossed it will recover otherwise it looks like you might have to take it out and replace it. And Liam Marshall has sent us through a picture he's got this sword shaped plant growing in his garden that's got a, looks like a crown growing out of the center and this has been happening now for the last few weeks and he's wondering what it is it's 10 years old. Well, the plant is a cordyline. It looks like cordyline australis, sometimes known as the cabbage palm. They can get quite tall and develop a trunk, but this is a, a flower spike that's growing right out of the center of the clump. And they do it when they get to a certain age, or if you get uh, you know, a dry summer or the weather can, it can induce the flowers to form. And they're quite unusual because they do look, as you say, a bit like almost a stag's antlers or a crown growing out. And they're the little tiny buds that are on there. Martin and they will open up into lots of little star-shaped flowers um, that are scented so look out for that and it's a bit unusual so it's the flowers on your corder line. Janice Marie Leek uh, or Maria has uh, got some semi-shade underneath an oak tree and she would like to know what will grow there to provide some colour uh, and will thrive in the dry conditions. Um, also, she doesn't want to have to keep weeding. So ideally what you need is ground cover. You've said it's semi-shade, so that should be okay, as long as there's some moisture there. Um, lots of ground cover plants will grow there. Ivies, you know, variegated green ivies make good ground cover. Geranium macrorhizum is really good. The pink 
ones or the white ones they will make a carpet under there things like pachysandra which is an evergreen ground cover plant is perfect some of the low grain cotoneasters would probably grow in that situation and if there is moisture some of the hardy ferns will tolerate fairly dry shady situations and then of course all the bulbs things like snowdrops and daffodils and bluebells would all look really good and give that woodlandy natural effect but whatever you do plant you will need to water it for the first season to get it established and weed until the ground cover fills out Mary Whiffen has got two sycamore trees in garden near her and she gets thousands of leaves. She wants to know what to do with the leaves and also with all the seeds that drop in the garden. Well, you are going to get lots and lots of leaves off a mature sycamore. They rot down very quickly, so if you can gather them up, Mary, I would add them to the compost heap or even make a separate compost heap with your grass cuttings and anything you're cutting down in your garden. They will all make good compost, but it's better to collect them, otherwise they just go mushy on the ground and some other plants. As for the seeds, if again if you can gather some of the seeds that will help otherwise some of them will germinate and you'll end up with lots of little sycamore seedlings which soon establish and if you let them establish they're difficult to get out so I'm afraid the only way is to rake them up or you could use one of the leaf facts uh, in the autumn to suck them up and get rid of them that way. Vicky Carr wants to know if this is the new garden it looks lovely. No it's not ours Vicky it belongs to a friend we just borrowed it to film it belongs to some friends in the village called Lesengill and it's a lovely little garden and we'll no doubt be back there again in the future. Um, the question is regarding pruning of shrubs to reduce the plant roots and Vicky wants to know that if you prune the top to make a shrub or a tree smaller does that reduce the root size or does it have the opposite effect well no it does actually if you've got a tree growing and before it gets too big you start to prune it back or a shrub to create a smaller canopy then the roots don't need to grow as big to support what would be a full grown plant uh, so yes in your case it's because you've got a um, ceanothus and a fig tree and you've been pruning them back to keep them small and control them so you will have a smaller root so that is exactly what will happen when you're doing the right thing. Um, Gemma Bennell uh, has got some dahlias that she's growing in pots. Are you all right, Molly? You're having a good old scratch down there. You're in the shade. Are you okay? Making a lot of noise though, just attention seeking, aren't you? Uh, but yes, Gemma's got some dahlias growing in pots that are wilting because they've had too much rain. The pots now have some drainage holes, so that would imply there was no drainage holes before Gemma. Um, and she wants to know should she repot them? when the rain stops, um, but she doesn't want to upset them and keep moving them about. Well, I, I would leave them as they are. The thing is, the no drainage holes has caused them basically to walk because the roots have been waterlogged. But now you've got some drainage and the water will go out of the pot, the roots will start to grow again and they should perk up. So I'd leave them alone, let them drain and only water when the compost starts to dry out. There may be a bit of extra feed just to build them up a bit, but don't take them out because it's just going to disturb them even more. We've got a few pests and disease questions, a couple on ants. First one is from Harvey Stafford. He wants to know how to get rid of the ants which have uh, found their way into his wooden veg planter. And Sally Cockin, I do apologise for Molly, you're right, um, who has got black ants uh, and they're building the colony in the compost bins. And she's tried everything to get rid of them, but they are now laying supersized eggs the size of grains of rice. Coffee tub, girl, coffee tub. I know I need a drink. Um, I think the problem with both these cases is the ground conditions are too dry. Ants love dry conditions. You never see them where it's wet and soggy. It's always dry. So I suspect the wooden plant at the soil is dry. There's a pocket of dry soil. And likewise with the compost bin. So have a ferret around with your fork, mix the soil, give it a good soaking with water so that it makes it uncomfortable for them. And they'll just clear off somewhere where it's nice and dry and get out of the compost bin and out of the compost bed. Ian Kettleborough uh, wants some help. He's saying, please, please help. I've got cats pooing all over the garden every night. He's tried lots of different things. Nothing seems to work for long and it's costing him a fortune. Well, we have a similar problem in the veg garden here. Neighbouring cats love the soil because it's nicely tilled and worked and it's great for them just to scratch a hole to use as a toilet. And what we use, and we've used them for several years in various gardens, are these sonic cat 
scarers and they this one is a, a solar one so it charges itself up you just push it into the garden and when something moves in front of it it detects it the lights flash it gives off a high pitch noise that we can't hear but the cats can it scares them off it doesn't harm them at all they just don't like it and we find if we've got these in the garden and we move them around uh, the cats never know which direction they can come in and, and they do work we find they certainly work for us so it's worth investing in one of those i think just to get rid of the cats in the garden i'm just going to turn that around because it's clicking margaret wrist says this isn't a question as such but she puts her tea bags on the garden uh, and since doing it she's had no problems with slugs and snails uh, or at least not like she used to have and she wants to know if that's why the slugs and snails have gone well it could be it might just be that the slugs and snails in your garden don't like tea so they're going somewhere else and finding something else to drink but now i don't really know if that's the cause or not but it's worth it if it's working for you keep doing it margaret the question is um, and she's saying it's one i won't be able to answer uh, how do you stop the rain spoiling roses? Well, as you've got roses opening in the garden and you get heavy rain, which some parts of the country have had, then yes, they go all sort of slimy and horrible and the flowers start to rot off and, and it looks horrible. If you deadhead them, they will produce more, but it spoils those initial flowers. Um, there are some roses that have got a better resistance to rain than others. The ones that tend to have more of an open flower than those very tight buds. The tight ones get the moisture between the petals, where the open ones, the water runs off and cultivars such as birthday girl, girl uh, avec armor bloom of truth bonica and bright star are just a few and if you look on the internet and google rain resistant roses there's a list there or several lists for you to choose from so yes you can still grow roses in rainy weather um, vicky carr has asked for some advice on the control and management of allium leaf miner. Last year it destroyed the leek plants um, and this year it's on the shallots and onions. So any tips to help get rid of it and stop it spreading around the allotment? Well, this is a serious problem in some parts of the country. It's a little fly that flies around. It's attracted by the scent of all alliums. They've got quite a distinctive scent lays the eggs on the foliage and in the case of leeks the little maggots hatch and go into the center of the leek and just eat the way so it completely ruins the crop really just shreds it almost um, there are no insecticides available to control it so the best way is to cover them over with insect proof netting a little bit like environment that very very fine meshing that allows the light and air through but it stops the insects getting to the crops and the time to cover them over the the critical times for allium leaf minor uh, is between March and May when they're active and laying the eggs and then a second generation is laid between September and November so that is the critical time to keep them covered but it's worth keeping them covered all the time just as you would if you're trying to control carrot root fly and that should keep the adults off and hopefully you won't have any problems with that at all. And then finally, David Jones said he's pulled up one of his garlics as the bottom leaves had withered and the tops were tips were yellow and withering, so thought they were ready, but the bulbs are tiny, barely bigger than the thickness of the stalk. Uh, wants to know if there's a better way to tell when they're ready. Well, I suspect they're probably not gonna get much bigger now. And I think it's been not a good year for lots of people with garlic. We had some and it just didn't like the wet weather that we had in May. It was cold and wet and the bulbs didn't swell. So I don't think you're on your own David with having poor garlic this year but what I normally do is wait until the tops die down more so rather than just one or two leaves while the leaf is green further up it's still feeding that bulb and it's still swelling so it's only when the leaves all go yellow that the bulb has stopped growing and you would normally lift it from the garden so that in most places is usually sort of July into August depending of course when you planted them so you may have been a bit early but I doubt they would have got much bigger but hopefully better luck next year and finally um, a comment and a question from George Flatley. George says, you always look so smart when you're gardening. Well, thank you, George. Um, do you have proper gardening clothes for when you aren't recording? Well, these are my proper gardening clothes. Um, I always, I'm a bit grubby today because I've been working in the garden all day and hoeing and it is dusty, but I, I wear boots, always wear jeans. They're my go-to gardening trousers and trademark for me is usually a check shirt in the winter it's long sleeves in the summer short sleeve check shirt so I, I wear 
this pretty much all the time. If I'm going to the pub for a drink, it's just a clean shirt and better jeans. But in the garden, it's jeans, check shirt. So what I wear for recording is my gardening clothes. So there you go. As I said, we can't answer them all today. So thank you for those. Hope that's helped. The others will be answered um, shortly for you. Um, on Facebook and then next week we've got a surprise for you because we're off to Harlow Car in Harrogate and we're going to look around the RHS garden there and show you some of the highlights but I think now Molly gets home it's tea time bit of cabbage for you and me and we'll see you next week bye That's mine. No, that's mine. This way, come on.